The NIV is the best Bible translation, and so is the NIRV, for certain people in certain circumstances. And I've come to San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge to tell you this. Who are the people and what are the circumstances in which the NIV might be useful? When I was 16, I never even considered that might be useful, let alone best. Considering that the people that I trusted told me that the N in NIV stood for Satan. <laughs> I'll tell you that story in a bit. I'll also talk about the NIRV in this video, the New International Reader's Version, which is made for those who read poorly, like kids and certain prisoners. Let's jump right in, though, to my reasons why or when the NIV is the best. Number one, the NIV is best for your church if your church already uses the NIV. If your church uses the NIV, read and be happy with it. Don't be casting sidelong glances at other translations, flirting with them, telling them that maybe if things were different, you'd be together, that you wish you'd met them while you were younger and unattached. No, the NIV is good. If your church uses it, be thankful. The NIV was put together by responsible evangelical people, headed up currently by someone who's super responsible, Doug Moo. He is the author of the Best Romans Commentary. But I literally know someone who left his church because he discovered that the Bible being used was the NIV 2011 rather than the NIV 1984. He caused a stink, too. I leave room for sincere disagreements over English Bible translation. Particularly, I can respect the man who says that for him in his house it's formal translations, not functional ones. But. I read this man's email, the man who made the stink. They were way over the top, insisting that the NIV was the first step on the road to the depths of degradé. I say first it's a little medicinal wine from a teaspoon, then preaching from the message. And next thing you know, your son is preaching for Osteen in a leisure suit and listening to some big church consultant, hearing him tell about church growth methods. Not a wholesome crusade, no, but an ad on a social media page. Friends, we got trouble. We got lots and lots of trouble. Trouble that starts with T and that rhymes with V and that stands for Satan IV. Okay, got carried away there, but not too much. I really frequently find myself asking, like, and what if people really read their NIVs hard? Like, what bad stuff is actually going to happen? Have any of the bad things that were supposed to happen from people reading the NIV ever actually happened and been traceable with any degree of confidence back to the NIV? This guy whose emails I read truly thought that the use of the NIV 2011 was a sign of impending theological liberalism. Don't be that guy. Be content with your pastor's choice. Evangelicals made the NIV. It's not perfect, but it's not a path leading to liberalism. Number two, the NIV is best for reading big chunks quickly. This was the advice that got me into reading the NIV in the first place, past the objections of my conscience. But it was a very conservative Bible teacher, later a decided Trump voter and gun rights advocate, by the way, who urged me to do this. That disarmed me. I was at a stage of my life when I was ready to trust people who clearly knew far, far more about the Bible than I did to tell me how to take steps to be like them. I pulled out my parents' old NIV. It might have been a 1978. It was pretty antiquated. But what actually struck me, and I've talked about this in other videos, was the layout. It was double column, like I was used to in my old King James Version. But verses were collected into paragraphs instead of, like my old King James, making every verse its own separate paragraph. And my conscience said, no, no, no paragraphs. My conscience actually used an interrobang, but I pushed past my malformed conscience with all its crazy punctuation. Because again, I knew my teacher knew the Bible in ways that I didn't. And my pastor at the time had begun to teach our church patiently about Bible translation. I put my hand to the NIV plow for a school assignment and I never looked back. Well, okay, I did look back a little. The NIV was so hated and distrusted among my friends, my tribe. Maybe I wasn't fit for the kingdom of Bible translation. I looked back when I touched the plow, but now I don't look back. The NIV really did help me traverse Bible territory smoothly. Indeed, think of the Bible like a road down which you're driving. When I drive from work to home, I have to weave through some twisty turns while going through the mountains. There are a few places where the driving has a little bit of difficulty to it, especially if it is rainy or dark. And the Bible obviously contains rainy, dark, twisty passages. I talked about this in my book, Authorized. Peter said that there are some things that Paul wrote that are hard to understand. I'm not inspired, but I think I could safely add that certain minor prophets are hard to understand. 
Certain sayings of Jesus are hard to understand. He too, Jesus himself, says in Matthew 13 that he purposefully uses parables to hide truth from some of his hearers. Some of the Bible, therefore, is difficult driving, and God intended it that way. But let me extend this analogy just a bit. One part of my drive that went through beautiful conifer-covered hills, kind of like these, has been recently paved. I noticed this because the ambient noise dropped drastically all of a sudden, and the car suddenly felt like it was sailing smoothly over glass. That's the NIV. The twisty passages are still there, the difficult driving is still there, but the going is smooth. The actual language, the English at the word and sentence level is not awkward and choppy, but natural. It's on long trips that I especially appreciate smooth new blacktop. A bumpy ride tires me out faster, and when I read the Bible in big chunks, I want to go far. So when I want to read big chunks of the Bible, the NIV is my go-to. I've read completely through at least two editions of the NIV. I could almost choose a passage at random to demonstrate this, but let's just look at one phrase in one verse. In 1 Corinthians 2.1, a more literal translation like the NASB has Paul saying, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom. And in one respect, that's exactly what Paul said in Greek, in pretty much just that order. And if you've grown up reading the Bible, particularly the King James Version, or another formal translation, a phrase like superiority of speech might sound normal to you. But it's not. No English speaker alive would ever say it that way today. It's Bibleese. It's Greeklish. Superiority of speech is a short stretch of asphalt that you drive over in about one second. A little rock, a, a, a little rock is jutting out of the asphalt. It's a bump. It's not a pothole. You can understand it, I think, but it doesn't make for smooth driving, especially when it's constant, the way it is in the New American Standard Bible, for example. And sometimes I wonder, I really do wonder if other people are like me. I think I get lulled to sleep by Bible is. Greeklish makes me think I'm understanding what I'm reading, but when I read the NIV, I suddenly start to wonder if I ever really did understand it. The NIV here at 1 Corinthians 2.1 has clear natural English. I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom. That's the way we really talk, or at least write. Both the NASB and the NIV are accurate, I'd say. But only one is smooth. Only one is natural English. Videos and articles comparing Bible translations can never really offer enough examples to be fair. I admit this. All I can do is offer examples that I think, having read all these translations, are representative. So here's another one. The ESV has Paul saying in Ephesians 6, Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Now the Greek says strength of his might. I knew this without even looking because the ESV is generally fairly literal. And this is classic Greeklish. But outside of the Christian community, I don't think you'll ever hear someone use a construction like the strength of his might. It makes sense, I think. It makes sense-ish. It's not Chinese. It's even beautiful in its way. But it's bumpy. It's not smooth, natural English. Listen to the NIV. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. When you've grown up with Greeklish, as I did, it takes incredible focus to spot it. It feels so natural. You think you understand. But over and over again, the NIV hits me with his mighty power and makes me realize I wasn't really stopping to think what strength of his might even means. Biblical scholars I respect often criticize the NIV for the heresy of explanation, a phrase I often associate with Robert Alter, the Jewish translator. So instead of translating Jesus' famous jot and tittle promise with the literal, literal Yoda and dot, the NIV uses an explanation. In the NIV, Jesus promises that not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of the pen, will in any way drop from the law until all is accomplished, Matthew 5.18. I think it's worth gaining a sense, even if you don't know Hebrew and Greek, for when the more formal translations stay formal and when the more functional ones, like the NIV, go functional. Read both kinds of translations regularly. Have some sense of why they differ. And you'll just know intuitively that iota is literal and the smallest letter is not so literal. And you'll understand the passage better. When you're driving slowly, there's benefits to bumpier asphalt. Let me keep the metaphor going a little bit. When you are going slowly, the bumpiness of a literal translation may actually be helpful. Maybe it will make you sit up and pay attention. 
maybe you'll notice little textual connections the author intended. Connections that whiz by too fast in the NIV's rendering so that you won't notice them. But as I said in my Incredit NASB video, translators simply cannot preserve all of those connections. If you want them, you'll have to give up some readability to get them. And you can get most of them in a more literal translation. Or you can get all of them by reading Hebrew and Greek. This is the way God made the world. But when your purpose is to move quickly, like when you're going 70, trying to get from point A in 1 Chronicles to point B in 2 Chronicles, choose the smoother road. Get an NIV. I have suddenly gone from sunny San Francisco to the snowy Pacific Northwest to tell you point number three. The NIV is best for those who judge that English has changed the way it expresses generic references, that is, to gender. Of course, the inclusive language debate is far bigger than the NIV, but in the evangelical space, the NIV is the biggest fish on the farm, and it is the one that has garnered the most controversy around the use of its gender language. I want to start by getting personal. I have a great deal of respect for Vern Poitras, one of the major combatants in this fight. The fight. <laughs> There's no other word for it even though Vern is nothing if not godly and gracious. I run his website. I have had a lot of personal interaction with him. He sends me a styrofoam container full of Omaha steaks every year. I am deeply grateful for him. I designed and I run one of his son's websites too, and both of his sons, Christian sons, adult sons, speak of him with an honor I pray my sons will use of me when that day comes, Lord willing. I. Uh, have been reading through the two-decade-old Poitras and Grudem book, The Gender-Neutral Bible Controversy, Muting the Masculinity of God's Words, which Poitras kindly sent to me after he read a brief but positive review from me of D.A. Carson's book, The Inclusive Language Debate, A Plea for Realism. I was shocked to see that Poitras would ever even encounter a blog post from my humble blog, let alone respond to it. I told Dr. Poitras that I would read his book, which I was actually already about 150 pages into in digital form when he sent me the paper copy. I felt I had to read enough of the book to be fair to him before producing this video. That's why I promised this video months ago and am only delivering it now and I still haven't had time to do all the reading I ultimately hope to do. But I've been thinking about this issue for many years. I did read all of Carson's book, and again, I've read enough of Poitras and Grudem's book that I think I can make a few responsible comments. And it's just time for me to put out my thoughts on the NIV. I can't delay any longer. Again, I hope at some point to have more to say on this issue, gender-neutral Bible translation, but I want to say what I need to say in order to serve my overall goal in this video, which is to free Christian consciences to read the New International Version and to train Christian minds to know what to expect of it, even if they end up disagreeing with its approach to gender language. I think I might be able to offer some peacemaking observations in a sometimes bitter internecine fight. I want to point out first that Carson and Poitras agree in critiquing certain excesses that occur in non-evangelical Bible translations like the NRSV. So both Poitras and Carson agree that some inclusive language in Bibles, especially some coming from, again, that mainline Protestant perspective, is bad. Carson and Poitras agree that if gender inclusive means outright changing clearly specifically male references to generic ones or even female ones, turning the Trinity into females or something, it's crossed a line. I'm not aware of any evangelicals that are talking in a way that justifies this kind of gender inclusivity. So this is not the issue among Bible-believing theological conservatives such as myself or Carson or Poitras or Grudem. The issue is whether apparently generic references to brothers or man or he actually now send the wrong message to a preponderance, a majority of contemporary readers. Does language change make relevant passages sound like they're addressing men exclusive of women. A classic example here is Psalm 1-1. It reads in the King James, in which I memorized it years ago, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the wicked, 
and etc. In the NIV 1984, it reads essentially the same, just in contemporary English. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. The NIV 2011 updates the idiom at the end of the phrase a little bit, but note for our purposes how it begins. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked. Blessed is the man has become blessed is the one. This is the kind of thing the argument among serious, faithful evangelicals is about. And let me bring what I hope to be some clarity to this argument by offering four questions over which I think good people can and do differ. First, is it true that a generic reference was intended here by the Spirit speaking by the tongue of David? That is, did the Spirit intend to speak of males or of mankind excluding women? Second, is it true that blessed is the man is now in fact understood by the average non-ideological reader to mean blessed is the male? Has English changed? Third, if the spirit did intend to specify males, did he do so because of linguistic or because of theological reasons? That is, does this passage say, blessed is the man in Hebrew, and it does, because that's the word ish that was used in such circumstances around the time, or because man is what Poythras and Grudem call a representative generic? Is it important to maintain man here in order to preserve the truth that the man was not created for the woman, but the woman for the man, or that the man was created first? Or is that reading too much into a merely linguistic choice? Fourth, and sort of getting back to the second point, if English has changed and man is no longer generic in context like Psalm 1-1, has it changed because of ideological pressure from feminists or due to natural forces within the language? One might assume that evangelical complementarians and egalitarians line up on either side of all the questions I've just mentioned, but that simply isn't so. Doug Moo of the Committee for Bible Translation, which is in charge of the NIV, is a complementarian, as is Mark Strauss, who's also on the CBT. I am a complementarian, and I'm willing to risk my reputation as a theological conservative to say that I lean pretty strongly toward the NIV's perspective on these things, while still acknowledging that Poythras and Grudem may turn out to be right on some of these questions on the day of final analysis, the day when we will all know even as also we are known. I also tend to use the ESV in preaching settings, and the ESV is my main squeeze if I have one. It does not use inclusive language. In other words, I don't think this issue has to be a make or break issue. I'm going to lay out briefly my position on these four points, and I'm going to camp out on the last one, or this video will end up being far, far too long, which it really is already, and here I go. First, on whether the Spirit intended man to be a generic reference in Psalm 1-1, I think it's reasonably obvious that God intended to include teen girls and women and boys they too will be blessed if they walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, stand not in the way of sinners, and meditate on God's law day and night. If non-ideological little girls are genuinely hearing Psalm 1-1 as excluding them, then that's a problem. Two, in my limited experience, a huge percentage of which is in the Christian community, I think that English really is changing, and that man in Psalm 1-1 sounds like it's specifying males, especially to those not yet familiar with church speak and Bibleese, and I'm always concerned to speak to those people. Long ago, I heard an evangelical egalitarian relate a story of his little girl saying to him, Dad, why is the Bible written to boys? I scoffed at this story. This sounded like the kind of thing that kids do because they picked up hints from their parents that that's what their parents would like to hear. It seemed to, to be too convenient, <laughs> but I carefully tucked this anecdote away, and when my own kids were born, they're shouting over there in the distance playing in the snow, which we don't get very often. I wanted their unvarnished opinion as kids. I didn't let, them, let on what I was thinking, and I, I got something like this from my little daughter. I can't recall the exact circumstance because when you have young kids, it's really hard to stop the careening train long enough to write anything down. But she basically said the same thing as the little girl in that decade plus old story. It was striking to me. And Doug Moo and his team at the NIV didn't just trust anecdotes like this. They did the proper academic work here. They did work in corpus linguistics, just like I do in a number of my false friends videos. That is, for these touchy questions of gender, they didn't just 
just trust their guts and their knowledge of English as native speakers. Instead, they commissioned a study in a massive body of English, a corpus, the Collins Corpus. They actually distinguished general written English, general spoken English, U.S. written English, U.S. spoken English, and they even added in a category of evangelical English. This is why we need committee-based translations put out by big institutions. It takes money and manpower to do this kind of work. Listen to the kind of careful conclusions and distinctions that they come to. Between 1990 and 2009, instances of masculine generic pronouns and determiners expressed as a percentage of total generic pronoun usage in written English fell from 22% to 8%. For example, when a person accepts unconditional responsibility, he denies himself the privilege of complaining and finding faults. Instances of alternative generic pronouns and determiners fell from 12% to 8%. For example, and this is what I often tend to do in writing situations, although I try to avoid it, any citizen who wants to educate himself or herself has plenty of sources from which to do so. Note the himself or herself, that those are the alternative generic pronouns. Instances of plural or generic pronouns rose from 65% to 84%. For example, if you can identify an individual who metabolizes nicotine faster, you can treat them more effectively. Notice the them. It's plural, but it refers to an individual, so it's not plural. This corpus yielded the conclusion that such usages are more and more common. Now, Vern Poitras is brilliant, I happen to know, and I happen to know that he knows language. I assigned one of his texts on language to my seminary students. He understands corpus linguistics. I'll tell you later what I think his reply to all of this is. But I have to say that the vast majority of critiques of so-called gender-neutral Bibles that I hear out there from my fellow conservatives show zero, and I do mean zero, understanding or recognition of the fine distinctions that I just brought up from the NIV's study in the Collins Corpus. In my experience, pastors especially answer the NIV before they hear it, and it is a folly and shame to them. And I'm not just talking about KJV onlyists here. More on this in a tiny bit. Third, on representative generics. This is tough. My mind is tied in a few knots on this. I'm still processing here. The Bible absolutely runs against contemporary sensibilities, and I want to run with the Bible. The NIV 2011 does not flinch from translating 1 Corinthians 11.9, neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. I am the head of my home, and I represent our home. In that, I take ultimate responsibility for it. I feel the weight of the fact that it's all too tempting to adjust the Bible around the edges to make it fit contemporary sensibilities better. And still, a part of me feels as if because of this it would be safer to stick with more literal renderings. But this is where I appeal back to my standard practice. We have an embarrassment of riches in English Bible translation, and it's a good thing that we have Bible translations that go different ways on points disputed by sound evangelical Christians. Those who compare translations regularly will have the best chance of understanding the issues involved. Fourth, where I'm currently seeing the disagreement, and I have to admit I may be wrong and Poitras is a lot smarter than I am, is whether or not the erosion of the generic man and he and maybe brother that we all do see in English prose is ideologically motivated to such a degree as to require contemporary English Bible translations to stick with that generic man or he. This is Poitras' answer, I think, to the arguments from corpus linguistics that I used earlier. In other words, these changes are there in English, but they're ideologically motivated. But I think we at least have to entertain the possibility that this ideological motivation is absent or maybe irrelevant. If it's absent, then there's no problem here. English has changed, radical feminists or no. And it's the translator's job to reflect the current state of English. Or you could say that the role of ideology in the changes in English uh, is irrelevant to the debate. Here's what I mean. You could say it's over. Maybe the change was wrought by women's libbers in the 1970s, but now the change is here. If children like my daughter are unselfconsciously learning in English that has little or no use for the generic he or man, then ideology is no longer relevant. 
they don't know where the change came from. They couldn't understand, even if they were told. This would no longer count as a change due to ideological motivation. I'm probably somewhere between these two possibilities here. I just think that with a ship as large as English, it's impossible to say if it turned because radical feminists got to the steering wheel for a few minutes. I'm inclined to distrust the argument citing ideological motivation for changes in English because that would have to be a hugely powerful force to make millions of people, the vast majority of whom have no care for the controversy du jour, change the way they speak. That is an extremely tall order. As a wannabe linguist, I'm just skeptical that this happens very often or that if it does, that it can be proven to have happened, that correlation can, can become causation. The somewhat bizarre foreword to Poitras and Grudem's book was written by a female elder among the disciples of Christ, and she actually backs me up. She said, we cannot consciously control the changes that languages undergo. We cannot prevent the changes. We cannot stop the changes once they're underway. We cannot predict what will change and what will not, and very seldom, if ever, can we consciously cause a grammatical change to occur. All attempts, for example, at coming up with truly gender-neutral pronouns, zhi, jim, zhir, whatever, have utterly failed. In those rare cases in which they get used, and I've never seen one in real life, like outside the lab, basically, I have to call them idiolectic power plays. They haven't caught on. Nobody uses them unselfconsciously. Lexicographers, to my knowledge, don't see such words as words at all, as part of the language. Valerie Mackay, who wrote that foreword to the Poitras Grudem book, thinks that changes in the meaning of generic he have been imposed from outside the language, that English hasn't been allowed to take its natural evolutionary course. And I say, even if feminists did have an influence here to turn the ship of English, would it then impossible if it weren't already listing to one side when it comes to gender indefinite pronouns, for example? As many have pointed out, Jane Austen in the 18th century used they repeatedly as a generic singular. Our language has long needed an established gender indefinite personal singular pronoun. Why didn't this happen before now? Why are the percentages changing as recorded by the Collins Corpus? I don't know, this is a complex question, but listen to the sentence. Susan and her brother Jimmy were playing a game. They looked at family photo albums to see who could find the ugliest picture of himself. That himself is just odd. There are times when you don't want to specify gender. I've heard very conservative Christian preachers, even baby boomers, use they as a gender nonspecific singular pronoun in formal preaching situations. My seminary dean did this once 15 years ago and I took note of it. Insofar as English has changed over time, if that's true, then it's not accurate to use he or man in the places where the author intended not to specify a sex. Think of something going the opposite direction in contemporary English. Guys and girls are opposite, right? Every Bible-believing Christian will rightly insist that guys are guys and girls are girls. I've written at length defending this view straight from Scripture, but I've many times heard a girl say to a group of girls, hey guys, let's go. Guys. Maybe there's a mom who says to such a girl, don't say guys, say gals. But that just sounds weird, affected, persnickety, pedantic, like saying, don't say I love ice cream, say you like it. People just can't keep up with all the rules of the prescriptivist. You just end up saying what's natural to you. Guys, when used as a vocative, a means of direct address, means my familiar friends who are with me. It doesn't mean males in that situation, as it apparently once did. Specifically, male terms can come through no nefarious actions by feminists to be generic in certain situations. Language does this. Language changes. One of my most respected friends says that even if language is changing, people aren't actively misunderstanding the generic he or just need a little training to understand it so it's convenient and useful. It sticks closer to the forms of the Hebrew and Greek. I can see this. Likewise, there was a utility in sticking with the and ye in the King James Version because these forms included number distinctions in the Greek that can't be reflected in cont contemporary English where we just say you for both. But with the passage of time, the and thou and ye have passed fully out of the standard language. They've actually come to communicate hoity-toitiness. There is a utility in the generic he, but I 
feel, I predict that that utility will decrease. If someone doesn't want to be on the forefront of linguistic change because of the risk of even appearing to sign on to feminist ideologies, honestly, I think that's reasonable. But on the flip side, those Christians ought to be willing to say to Doug Moo or to me, we believe you when you say that you are not ideologically motivated. Now, this gender inclusivity in English Bible translation, evangelical English Bible translation, is a huge issue to a lot of people, including many people I respect. I want to say humbly and carefully that if I'm right to question that correlation equals causation in this case, that is, to argue that the rise of feminism is not indeed responsible or can't be proven to be for the diminution of the generic he and man, if I'm right to plead for liberty but to, to, to read the complex interrelations of language and culture differently than a lot of my fellow theological conservatives, then I have to accord them the same liberty. I knew a godly man who just couldn't bring himself to read the Chronicles of Narnia to his children. He couldn't, in good conscience, picture Jesus as a lion. I think he's wrong. Of course, the Bible pictures him as a lion anyway. But I accepted his conscience, and I didn't push. And he made it a whole lot easier by giving me liberty, too. Maybe everybody should tone down the rhetoric. Well, everybody who's freaking out. Proponents of inclusive language in evangelical Bible translations are going to call their approach gender accurate. Opponents are going to call it gender neutral. I think it's fair for both sides to do what D.A. Carson did and call it gender inclusive. I'm okay with someone saying, as one of my best friends has, I don't think English has changed enough to justify the way the NIV 2011 treats gender pronouns in edge cases. But I will not doubt the motives of the NIV translators, just their judgment. I'm okay with the church using the ESV or NASB instead of the NIV for this reason. I'm not okay with the full-on culture war language in the dedication to Poitras and Grudem's book. It was written by Professor Harold Hill, the one who gave us the trouble that starts with tea song. It's alarmist. It's exaggerated. It's over the top. Quote, to Joel Bells, that's of World Magazine, and James Dobson, then of Focus on the Family, this is back in the early 2000s, who saw that the preservation of God's word was at stake and stood firm. Carson pled for realism. I plead for peace. There are multiple questions in this debate over which I think good Christians can disagree because the Bible does not speak directly to them. The Bible doesn't tell us whether particular changes in English are ideologically motivated. It's understandable that we would come to disagree on questions related to that. That kind of does it for my arguments for when and for whom the NIV is best. Let me turn now, although this video should probably be ending, to something that is also the best Bible translation for certain people in certain circumstances. I'm talking about the NIV's younger cousin, the New International Reader's Version, or NIRV. Now let's talk about the NIRV, the New International Reader's Version. What is it best for? It's useful for evangelism and for children and other poor readers. You can always reach down, but rarely up. The novels of Marilyn Robinson are seen as contemporary American literary treasures. Robinson is an essayist and novelist whose rather liberal version of the Christian faith nonetheless coexists with some profound insights into the Bible and a stalwart defense of the God of the Old Testament. There is no one quite like Robinson. I've read many of her essays and I think all of her famous Gilead novels. The most recent is Lila. Tragically, Lila was abused as a child, spent time as a prostitute, and was what was then in the time of the story called a hobo. Wonderfully, the love of a widowed old pastor, the main character of the Gilead novels, John Ames, had a redeeming effect in Lila's life. But despite the beauty of the prose and of certain themes in the story, I had some negative reactions to some elements of the story. I served some uneducated women like Lila, women who'd been on the streets. And I just couldn't square the picture of Lila that Robinson painted with my experience. For one thing, Lila remained innocent. Lila never actually is described as sleeping with the John, and it wasn't that way in the real world. But what struck me most negatively was, of all things, <laughs> Lila's habit of reading Ezekiel in the King James Version and asking her husband profound questions about it. Of course, I cannot and will not say that it's impossible for former prostitutes who never went to school to read the major prophets in the King James Version. Humans are made in God's image. We can do remarkable things. But I was so desperate as an outreach pastor to help the down and out read their Bibles. 
And I didn't dare start in Ezekiel and use a 400-year-old Bible translation. I would have encountered blank stares. If Lila's experience was possible, it was, in my opinion, rather uncommon. The NIRV, New International Reader's Version, was made for young children and other struggling readers. It's often used in prisons. And I was so, so grateful for it. You see, I had the privilege of teaching almost every Sunday morning for six years, teaching the Bible to functionally illiterate adults in an outreach ministry. These folks listened well to the Bible, but they choked on the King James, the NASB, and even the ESV. They simply got lost in all the verbiage. These people knew many things I did not. They had many skills I lacked, but reading was not one of those skills. It was a struggle for them to read anything. Most of them stumbled when reading aloud, and they read so haltingly I had to wonder if they were following at all. It was a sign that they knew I loved them, that they were ever willing to read out loud in our small group. They knew I would not mock them for their stumbles. But as a simple, practical matter, there was kind of no point in handing them our church's main Bible, the New American Standard Bible. I don't want to have the soft bigotry of low expectations. Parts of the Bible will always be difficult. Even the Apostle Peter called some of Paul's scriptural writings hard to understand. But you can insist that an elderly eighth grade dropout learn proper English and you can risk embarrassment to her, or you can meet her where she is with the NIRV. The NIRV uses shorter sentences that are a huge aid to the public reading of scripture I was always doing. The NIRV also restates the subject of a sentence rather than using a pronoun frequently. This alone was fantastically helpful, and I have found myself doing it even when I read publicly in uh, my normal church from more literal translations. I preached through Romans, the Sermon on the Mount, and the entire Old Testament, hitting the high points. And all along, the NIRV allowed me to explain the Bible rather than being forced to explain the English. At the beginning of Ephesians, Paul has several famously massive sentences. For example, the first major paragraph of the letter is rendered in three sentences in the ESV and the NASB. In the NIRV, it's 20. Just listen to the NIRV. Give praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Those blessings come from the heavenly world. They belong to us because we belong to Christ. God chose us to belong to Christ before the world was created. He chose us to be holy and without blame in His eyes. He loved us, so He decided long ago to adopt us as His children. It's a bit choppy, but it's so much easier on poor readers than the demanding clause after subordinate clause after subordinate clause in the more literal Bible translations. I know this because I could read to my congregation out loud and ask them questions, and they would show that they had followed. If we're on a quest for the best Bible translation, the one translation to rule all others, it won't occur to us to look for something like the NIRV because it isn't going to win the best translation competition for any of the people playing that sport. It's a little stilted when you have such short sentences. It is not exactly beautiful literarily. But if we're on a quest for the most useful Bible translation, given our immediate purposes and audience, we'll be open to getting help from a wonderful tool like the NIRV. I didn't and don't use the NIRV with my own kids. As soon as my eldest started to read, his reading took off like a rocket, a super rocket with red fins and a warp engine. Of course, he was still six. He didn't always understand everything that he read in the Bible, but it became quickly apparent that his problems were not with words so much as concepts. He could read a sentence fluently out loud, even if the meaning overall wasn't clear to him. I felt like the benefits of putting him on a more formal translation consistently over his lifetime would outweigh the benefits of using an easy to read translation over on. So I gave him an ESV, or rather his grandmother did. But if you've had kids, you know it's just hard to keep all the plates spinning with them. You can't and don't really want to control every last thing about their upbringing. So my son ended up getting hold of a CSB study Bible that I had, and he's read that a fair bit too. I really do feel as if everybody out there is on that quest for the best Bible translation. And sometimes I feel like I'm shouting into the void that it's totally the wrong quest. You need to find what is most useful for the circumstance that you're in. The NIV is the best translation for certain people in certain circumstances. The NIRV is the best Bible translation for certain people in certain circumstances. Next week, the NASB is the best, and so is the LEB. 